Hi, this is History with Andrew Allen, and today is episode two of The Devil's Brood. Before I forget, I include the names of the people I talk about and my sources in the description. In part one of The Devil's Brood, I examined the struggle for the English throne between Empress Matilda and her cousin Stephen, which led to a devastating civil war that became known as the Anarchy. Exhausted by more than a decade of warfare, Matilda left England and retired to a comfortable abbey in Normandy in 1148. However, she had a son, Henry. So, the war would continue. So, how exactly did Henry become king? Was it a simple matter of him appearing in England and the warring factions uniting behind him? Not exactly. When 14-year-old Henry crossed the Channel to England with mercenaries in 1147, he discovered that he had little support on his own and he soon ran out of money to pay his men. There is a story that Stephen sent him the money as a goodwill gesture to hopefully find an end to the Civil War, or to ridicule him as an overbold boy, or both. Two years later, Henry led another invasion of England, which failed again. But he reminded Stephen's barons that they had another option other than Stephen or Matilda. Although he returned to Normandy with little other than experience, his father was clearly impressed since Henry was formally appointed Duke of Normandy in 1150. Joffrey likely made Henry Duke of Normandy at an early age to increase his standing in the Anglo-Norman world, thus improving his chances of gaining the throne of England. Joffrey had been able to focus on conquering Normandy because Louis, king of France, had been away for two and a half years on crusade, but he had returned in November 1149. Realizing that a reunited England and Normandy would be a threat, Louis allied with Stephen's son Eustace to attack Normandy. Although the attack failed, Joffrey advised his son to exchange the Vexen a key border area between Normandy and France for recognition as Duke, and Louis agreed in August 1151, happily abandoning Eustace, his ally and brother-in-law. When Joffrey died on September 7th as they were returning from Paris, Henry delayed his planned invasion of England in order to ensure the security of his rule in Anjou. Appointing himself count, Henry gave his younger brother Joffrey four castles, even though there is strong evidence that their father had intended the elder son to receive Normandy, and the claim to England, and the middle son, Anjou. Henry's situation changed dramatically when he married Eleanor of Aquitaine on May 18, 1152, in a wedding that had been planned quickly and secretly. He was 19, and she was 28 famed for her beauty and her sharp mind. Eleanor will be a key player in this series, so I will take a bit of time to give some background. Besides, her life is fascinating. A vast territory that made up a quarter of modern France, Aquitaine included the county of Poitou, the Duchy of Gassigny, the counties of Saint-Ange, Angoulême, Pédagogue, the Limousin, La Marche, and the Auvergne. Despite the impressive size, the various counts and barons feuded endlessly with each other while paying lip service to their overlord, the Duke of Aquitaine, whose authority was limited to Poitiers, the capital, and the city of Bordeaux. Duke William X inherited a lawless kingdom in 1127, and both his wife and his heir died in the spring of 1130, making his daughter Eleanor heiress to the duchy. Unlike most of Europe, Aquitanian law had been influenced less by the church, so women had more rights. They could inherit property, and noble women could rule over lands they inherited while they were expected to take part in society, not wait quietly at home. After a brief, unsuccessful attempt to help Joffrey of Anjou invade Normandy, William intended to go on pilgrimage, but he decided to set his affairs in order just in case. Seeking a powerful ally, he proposed that 14-year-old Eleanor marry the son of his overlord, Louis VI, King of France. If Eleanor had a son, then France would gain Aquitaine forever. So, Louis naturally agreed. This proved to be a good decision, since William died suddenly while on pilgrimage on April 9, 1137. 
17-year-old Prince Louis became Louis VII when his father died a week after the wedding. The marriage was a good match politically, but not personally. Louis had originally been intended for a career in the church until his older brother died in an accident when he was 10, but he never seemed to have left the church. The young king had an austere devotion to God, while Eleanor enjoyed a worldly, extravagant life. Arriving in Paris, Eleanor discovered that she was expected to be a quiet, decorative companion to her husband and spend her time in religious study. The church taught that married couples should have sex for procreation only, not pleasure, and sex could not take place on Sundays, holy days, feast days, or during pregnancy, menstruation, or the 40 days of Lent. The fact that the population of France increased indicates that most people did not take the church's teachings seriously, but the pious Louis followed those restrictions closely. Louis was a humble young man, but he had a tendency towards rash actions, such as his decision to invade Toulouse, undoubtedly prompted by Eleanor, who had a claim to the county. An invasion of Toulouse was risky without the support of his vassals, but Louis did not consult with them. Since Louis had made no effort to convince them to risk their lives and resources in an invasion of a powerful county, several vassals simply did not send men. Most notably, Count Theobald of Champagne, otherwise known as King Stephen's older brother. Unsurprisingly, the campaign against Toulouse failed, so a furious Louis decided to punish Count Theobald and invaded Champagne in January 1143. While attacking the town of vitry sur marne Louis lost control of his mercenaries who looted and torched the town. More than a thousand people had gathered in the cathedral for safety, but they all died when it caught fire. Shaken by the disaster, a guilt-ridden Louis sought absolution. An opportunity presented itself when the Muslims of Mosul and Aleppo captured the crusader-controlled city of Edessa on December 24, 1144, leading the Pope to launch the Second Crusade. The initial response was not enthusiastic, since the French barons felt that it was the crusaders' kingdom's problem if they could not defend themselves. But Eleanor relished an opportunity to leave suffocating Paris and convinced several of her vassals to take the cross. After much organization, the crusade finally commenced in May 1147. Louis and Eleanor traveled separately, and don't worry, a bodyguard stationed at the entrance to his tent ensured that Eleanor did not keep her husband from his prayers. The crusaders chose the overland route, which passed through Byzantium, rather than the risky voyage across the Mediterranean. While the Christian emperor of Byzantium should have been happy to see a crusader army, Manuel had little interest in huge foreign armies marching through his empire, so he wanted them to leave as soon as possible and hopefully damage his aggressive Turkish neighbors enough to give him some peace. This strategy produced mixed results. Conrad, king of Germany, was lured into an ambush and lost most of his men. Poor coordination ensured that the French followed the path of the Germans and managed to fall into a trap set by the Turks as well. But the survivors finally reached Antioch on March 19th, where they were welcomed, but soon argued with their host over strategy. Count Raymond of Antioch, supported by his niece Eleanor, wanted to attack Aleppo, which admittedly was much closer than Edessa, while well, Louis wanted to go to Jerusalem. Actually, there were other reasons for conflict between Louis and Raymond, namely disturbing rumors about the relationship between Raymond and Eleanor. There is no doubt that Eleanor's close bond with her uncle angered Louis, but there is no evidence that it was sexual. It may have simply been an extremely deep emotional relationship. Since Louis had essentially cut himself off from his wife, his reaction is odd. As tensions between the married couple worsened, Eleanor had an audience with Louis, where she explained that she had resolved to give up the crown and remain in Antioch, pointing out that as fourth cousins, they were too closely related to be married. Uncomfortable with the challenge of marriage counseling, Louis' barons handled the matter by kidnapping her as the French made their way out of Antioch, under the cover of darkness on March 28th. Reaching Jerusalem, they were reunited with Conrad and what was left of the German army. 
The debate over Aleppo or Edessa was settled when Queen Melisende of Jerusalem persuaded the two kings to support her against Damascus, even though it was one of the few, if only, Muslim princedoms that was an ally of Jerusalem and a rival of Aleppo. The combined armies attacked Damascus on July 24th, but failed to break through and abandoned the siege after less than a week, fearing the arrival of troops from Aleppo. The single joint crusader campaign ended in embarrassment and bitter accusations between the leaders. Conrad soon left for Constantinople, but Louis was a true believer, so he remained to sightsee and pray in Jerusalem until April 1149. The couple finally reached Paris in November after a journey of 30 months that had accomplished little aside from many, many pointless deaths. Relations between Louis and his queen continued to deteriorate, especially after Eleanor learned that her uncle Raymond had died in a rash battle against a larger Muslim army. When she gave birth to another girl in 1150, Louis' barons began to press the king to annul his marriage and find another queen. That August, Geoffrey of Anjou and his son Henry of Normandy arrived to pay homage to Louis, so Eleanor saw nobles who matched her temperament more than her monkish consort. However, despite the claims of later chroniclers with a fondness for gossip, there is no evidence that she plotted with either or both of them to end her marriage, or had an affair with either of them. It is simply unknown, but it seems unlikely that they would have been left alone for long, given the many restrictions on Eleanor's life in Paris. While their lack of marital harmony was undoubtedly annoying for both of them, their failure to produce a son threatened the future of the Capetian dynasty. In March 1158, Archbishop Hugh of Saint convened a synod to debate the matter and ended the marriage on the basis of consanguinity, a fancy word for being too closely related, which must have been a surprise after 16 years of marriage. Both were permitted to remarry, but their daughters were declared legitimate and would remain in Louis' custody. Undoubtedly relieved to be free of France and its monkish ruler and looking forward to a future as Duchess of Aquitaine, Eleanor left Paris, but a funny thing happened on the way home. She learned that both Count Theobald de Blois, Stephen's nephew, and Geoffrey Plantagenet, Henry's younger brother, were pursuing her with the intent of marriage. The more romantically inclined might think that the two young nobles were hoping to win her hand in marriage through flowers, poetry, and wine, but that would be incorrect. They wanted to capture her, find a pliable priest, and drag her into a bedroom to consummate the marriage. Whether she was willing, enjoying the process, or even conscious was irrelevant. Unwilling to be raped into losing control of her duchy, Eleanor rode hard and reached Poitiers, the capital of Aquitaine. But she knew that she could either live like a nun in her castle, unless one of her suitors, would-be rapists, was determined enough to besiege the castle, or she could marry again. Unsurprisingly, she chose the latter option, but this time she would choose her husband. Having been impressed by Henry, she sent him a marriage proposal. At that time, Henry was preparing to invade England, but he won the support of his vassals to postpone the invasion and accept Eleanor's proposal. Henry and Eleanor did not bother asking their overlord Louis for permission to marry because they knew he would not approve. Since they had ensured that the marriage negotiations were secret, there are no documents available to confirm whether or not it had been planned in advance. The marriage completely transformed the power structure in France, since Henry now controlled Anjou, Normandy, and Aquitaine. Basically, half of France. When the new couple had a son soon after, Louis' daughters with Eleanor lost their claim to Aquitaine. Furious, Louis resolved to punish the new couple, but he was too weak to face Henry alone. Needing allies, he gathered an impressive coalition of rejected suitors of Eleanor and rivals of Henry, including, including Counts Eustace of Boulogne, Stephen's son, Geoffrey of Anjou, Henry of Champagne, and Theobald de Blois. While impressive on parchment, the assorted counts did not fight well together, 
and Henry had beaten them decisively in six weeks. Aware that Henry was occupied, Stephen made his last major attempt to overwhelm Henry's supporters in England by hiring mercenaries. The strategy seemed ready to succeed until Henry risked a dangerous channel crossing with his own force of mercenaries in January 1153. Henry soon made two discoveries. The English were exhausted by the Civil War, and people were terrified by Henry's foreign mercenaries. Even though it weakened his army, Henry sent his mercenaries back across the channel and negotiated with barons and bishops to win their support. A key recruit to Henry's cause was Robert Beaumont, Earl of Leicester, one of Stephen's earliest supporters who had lost faith in Stephen due to his inability to protect Leicester's lands in Normandy. The Earl then did homage to Henry, opening up the Midlands. Recognizing the advantage of a less violent strategy, Henry toured the Midlands offering peace and stability instead of ravaging the land. Stephen knew that he could not permit Henry to parade through England as a king in waiting, so the two sides led their armies to face each other at Wallingford in early August to settle the matter. However, neither side's barons wanted to fight anymore, so the two rivals were forced to talk instead. Actually, this sudden preference for peaceful negotiation should not have been a surprise. Tired of the destruction that accompanied the endless conflict, barons on opposing sides had begun to make private treaties with each other. The negotiations were overseen by Theobald, Archbishop of Canterbury, and his right-hand man, Thomas Becket, who persuaded Stephen to accept Henry as his heir. This decision to prevent more killing pleased everyone. Well, almost everyone. Stephen's eldest son, Eustace, Count of Boulogne, had been raised to believe that he would inherit the English crown, and he had been working to conquer Normandy by marrying Constance, sister of Louis VII, and allying with Henry's younger brother Joffrey. Peace required Stephen to disinherit his sons, which became easier when Eustace conveniently became ill and died suddenly on August 16th or 17th. The exact details of the peace were worked out during September and October. Aside from Eustace, the deaths of several key supporters had weakened Stephen's desire to fight. In particular, his wife Queen Matilda, who had led the defense when Stephen was a captive, had died in 1152. Furthermore, Stephen had relied heavily on William of Ypres, who had become a mercenary after failing to win the position of Count of Flanders. Ruthless but loyal, William was elderly and going blind, depriving the king of a valued enforcer. Eustace's death made peace more likely, but he had a younger brother, William. The fact that he did not directly oppose the peace, which would deny him the throne, shows that he either lacked the determination to fight or simply recognized that no one wanted any more fighting, so he would lose. William accepted a large grant of land in exchange for formally abandoning his claim to the throne. So Henry and Stephen met with the bishops and barons at Winchester, where Stephen announced the Treaty of Winchester on November 6, formally declaring Henry to be his heir. While it would be natural to expect that Henry was happy with this situation, he was a young man filled with fire and he probably wanted a decisive victory, especially since Stephen could have likely lived for another decade. After traveling around the kingdom to receive homage as the heir, Henry returned to Normandy in March, leaving Reginald of Cornwall, a supporter of his mother, to represent his interests. Henry had probably resigned himself to wait patiently for years until Stephen died, but to his pleasant surprise, he did not have to wait long, since Stephen died on October 25th, 1154. Stephen may have died frustrated by his failures, but there is little doubt that everyone was tired of war, because Henry remained in Normandy for six weeks settling matters, and no one opposed him when he finally crossed the channel with his wife. No disrespect to Henry, he undoubtedly possessed astonishing drive and leadership ability. But he also had more than his share of good luck. Eustace conveniently died just as Henry became a serious contender for the throne, and then Stephen died a year later. If Stephen had lived longer, his younger son William may have decided that he deserved the throne. When Henry was crowned on December 19th, 1154, he was the first to be crowned King of England, rather than King of the English. 
Henry chose to rely on a rising young noble Richard de Lucy and Robert Beaumont, Earl of Leicester, probably the most powerful noble in England. Lucy had ability, while Leicester had judgment and connection to the barons. Thomas Becket was appointed chancellor, essentially the chief of staff. Despite the instability of the anarchy, the English economy was growing. While tin mines in Devon and Cornwall were booming, England's main export was wool. Poor roads meant that people traveled by river, so towns by major rivers such as Gloucester, York, and Norwich thrived. Although crossing the channel took days and was often dangerous, foreign trade with France, Italy, Flanders, Scandinavia, and the German states kept the Thames full of ships. The 12th century saw an increase in the number of towns. London had a population of roughly 35,000, but other cities were far smaller. Winchester, York, Lincoln, and Nork all had less than 10,000 people. Even so, England needed a lot of work. Royal revenue had decreased by two-thirds under Stephen, powerful earls had become semi-independent rulers, and the King of Scotland ruled much of northern England. The number of castles had grown rapidly, many of them manned by foreign mercenaries. The more independent-minded barons may have believed that Henry's many responsibilities in France would prevent him from making the effort to impose order on England. They were wrong. Following the example of his father, Henry moved slowly and always made sure that the great council of barons supported his actions. When Henry became king, he issued a coronation charter like Stephen and Henry I, while his grandfather's charter had been a list of promises to the church and the barons, and Stephen's charter had explained the crown's duties to the church, Henry did not offer concessions. Instead, he refused to confirm all of the grants made by Stephen and announced a return to the situation at the time of the death of his grandfather. Furthermore, he set a time limit for the destruction of illegal castles and the departure of the foreign, mostly Flemish, mercenaries who had been used by local lords to control their territories. More than a hundred castles were destroyed, and he reclaimed a number of royal castles that had been occupied by ambitious barons during the anarchy. Baron Hugh Mortimer was unimpressed with Henry until the new king laid siege to three of his castles at once. After they fell, a humbled Mortimer submitted. Since he applied this policy to both Stephen's supporters and his own, he ended the factions that had divided the kingdom, and Henry's reign was secure by the end of 1155. Henry soon settled the border with Scotland in a manner that favoured England, but Wales proved more troublesome. A lengthy campaign forced the Welsh princes to sue for peace, and royal castles were constructed to both protect the Norman part of Wales and to block the expansion of the Earl of Chester's lands. Ruling over a huge kingdom, Henry traveled constantly, determined to keep in touch with events in his widespread dominions. While his boundless energy made this approach possible, it is likely that the ruling style reflects his nature, since contemporary observers all described him as a man who never stayed still who seemed incapable of even sitting down or fixing his attention on a single activity, as if he suffered from ADHD. Although Henry was always on the road, he centralized his administration, making Westminster the center for England and Rouen for the continental domains. Furthermore, Henry dismantled the conflicting governments of Stephen and his mother, building a new, unified system that relied heavily on Nigel, Bishop of Ely, to run the exchequer, who trained enough skilled officials to make the detailed records required to levy fair taxes on the kingdom. While the king traveled constantly, the exchequer and the chancery, the office of the chancellor, received permanent rooms in Westminster, forming a stable government. Clearly, the personal nature of the marriage worked as well as the political aspect, since Eleanor gave birth to numerous children and served as regent while Henry was across the channel. Eleanor could not stop Henry from sleeping around, but he did not prevent her from becoming in politics, which angered contemporary chroniclers. Since Henry was constantly traveling, he rarely saw his wife, except to impregnate her, and spent even less time with his children. 
Henry had little love of pomp and lacked the patience needed to entertain visiting nobles unless they were of sufficient rank that his personal attention was required. So this task was delegated to Thomas Becket, who appeared to love hobnobbing with earls and foreign envoys. The son of a wealthy merchant who had been given a good education, Becket acted like a member of the Nouveau Riche, traveling with an awe-inspiring entourage, while Henry's entourage was small, well, small for a king. Still, Becket proved to be the skilled administrator that Henry needed to keep his vast empire functioning. While England had been pacified relatively easily, Henry faced more resistance from his younger brother Joffrey, who believed that their father had intended him to receive Anjou, Maine, and Touraine once Henry became king of England. Henry disagreed, especially since Joffrey had previously allied with Louis. The feud between the brothers brought Matilda out of retirement to oversee a family conference in February 1156, but the conference failed and Joffrey rebelled again. Rather than adopt the crushing expense of transporting his vassals across the channel, with the serious likelihood that they would depart before the fighting was finished, Henry relied on Becket to bring back an unpopular war tax called scootage, basically shield money that had been used by his grandfather to raise money from barons rather than calling them up for military service. The money enabled him to hire an army of mercenaries who would be reliable. This approach would be a key factor in Henry's success, as he employed his wealth to hire professional soldiers rather than depend on fickle barons. Faced with Henry's armies, Joffrey surrendered. Still, what to do with a rebellion-prone brother? Well, a position opened up in Brittany. Normandy had long claimed Brittany, so Henry was eager to expand his influence into the duchy. Fortunately for him, it was in the middle of a civil war following the death of Duke Conan III eight years earlier. Unlike the rest of Brittany, which was separated from the rest of France by rivers and mountains, the county of Nantes was linked to Anjou by the Loire, therefore Nantes shared more in common with Anjou. In fact, Conan's mother was Ermengarde, sister of Count Fouque V of Anjou, Henry's paternal grandfather. Serving as regent for her young son following her husband's abdication, Ermengarde ensured that there were close relations between Anjou and the counties of Nantes and Rennes. As a result, the citizens of Nantes chose to accept his troublesome brother as count, and Henry was able to convince the Breton barons to accept his vassal, Conan IV, Earl of Richmond, as duke. Hopefully, a nice title would prevent his brother from rebelling again. It is worth pointing out that Henry had far surpassed the accomplishments of his grandfather. Duke William of Normandy had transformed the power dynamic in Europe when he conquered England, but he essentially negated his own achievement by dividing England and Normandy between his two sons. The third son, Henry I, managed to replicate it in reverse by conquering Normandy. However, his grandson now ruled England, Normandy, Anjou, and Aquitaine, as well as controlled Brittany. Admittedly, he was not in Charlemagne's league, but he had still carved out the greatest empire since the father of Europe. The question is, what would he do with it? And I will answer that question in part three of The Devil's Brood. Thanks for listening.